were singing that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, it reminded me of, of our experience this weekend in uh, Santa Barbara. We were having this, uh, this Sabbath worship, and, and one of the things that we were praying for the night, the night before that, uh, that Sabbath worship is that uh, we will have a, a positive influence in the camp that we are in because we are in, in a public camp. We chose this cul-de-sac where uh, it's, it's gonna be the last place in that part of the big camp. And so while we were having our, our morning's uh, program, it's like a divine service, we saw two couples, two, uh, I don't know, a couple, husband and wife, they're like, I think in their 50s, and they came, they passed by, and then they stayed. They stayed throughout the entire program. Later on, we found out that uh, they, were, they were asking the, the grounds personnel if they have a service, and they said, what service? Like any religious service? They said, no, we don't do that. And while they were going around, this, this is a huge, uh, a huge place. While they were going around, they were, they were hearing songs, and then the, the song mentioned Jesus or God, and said, oh, there is a service. <laughs> So then they kept on looking and looking for, for those group of people who were singing. And then they found us. And then they said, we offer them seats that they will not seat. And they stood up for more than an hour. And they stayed and stayed until my whole sermon was over. People were leaving and they were still there. And they want to talk. And it's such an amazing experience. And this is what happens, my dear friends, when, when we fix our eyes upon Jesus. And we don't know that the influence is just like radiating and they said, this is such an amazing morning here. And they said that uh, it was a huge, uh, a, 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 a huge privilege for them and a joy for them to attend the service. And they didn't know that uh, it's a higher joy for us to see them there. <laughs> God is good, amen? So last night we talked about, talked about how good our God is, how he deserves praises and, and our thanksgiving. And uh, this uh, morning, I'd like to continue on that. And if I have to choose a theme for, for this week, and every week that I do a week of prayer, I'll always choose the theme absolute reliance. Because that's the only reason I survive. That's the only reason I function. And absolutely relying on the Lord for everything. Amen? With that being said, let's, let's spend one more time on our knees. Our great God, our dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, good morning. We give you praise and we give you thanks because we will not have this morning if, if you are not with us. So Lord, I pray in a very special way that may each and every heart and mind, and may each and every fiber of our being, we just turn towards you. And Lord, I pray that uh, may you pour upon us a full measure of your spirit. Once again, dear Father, I pray that you please hide me behind the shadow of your cross, that Jem would not be seen, that Jesus and Jesus alone be seen, be heard, be lifted up and exalted. Lord, please teach us to lift you up higher than we have lifted you up before. And please pour upon us a full measure of your spirit. For we ask this in the loving name of your son, Jesus. Amen. There is this one quote that it really gives me so much joy. I just read this like a couple of months ago. I was, uh, I don't know how I, oh, I was looking for, for some topic and I encounter this in Patriarchs and Prophets. I've, I've read Patriarchs and Prophets so many times. But one beautiful thing about the spirit of prophecy, every time you read it, there's just another new gift that you open. That's why it's called the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Amen? And the gift, you will not enjoy it until you open it. And this is one beautiful gift that you keep on reopening it and you keep on rediscovering new things. And listen to this, to this thought here. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 717, paragraph one. It says, the tenor of the Bible, it's not just talking about the, the tenor, the, the one that's uh, involved in choir. <laughs> the tenor, it's the flow, it's the subject, it's the theme of the Bible. Listen. The tenor of the Bible is to inculcate distrust of human power. Isn't this powerful? Distrust of human power and to encourage trust 
in divine power. Isn't this powerful? Into, is to inculcate distrust in what? In what we can do in human power and to encourage trust in divine power. But we are too slow. I, I, maybe I'm speaking for myself. We are too slow in learning this. This lesson that the Bible is talking about, we emphasize so much most of the time on our potentials that we forget to rely fully on the one where those potentials are coming from. And if you look back on the Bible, look at this, the stories of the Bible, every story of the Bible, just for example, David. Why did Goliath came at such a time that David was still a boy? That David was not a grown man, a warrior. That David was a boy because God wants to emphasize that it's not the sling that won the battle. It was the God who empowered the sling. Can you say amen? And look at Joseph. Joseph, before he was, he, was be, he was able to be used by God, he has to be a slave first and a convict before he could be used. Let's go to Moses. Moses has to unlearn everything that he has learned. He was, he was enrolled in the most prestigious university in, in the whole world during a time, UE, University of Egypt. But he has to be sent out to to go to the UD, University of the Desert, <laughs> to learn what God would teach him to learn, and that is absolutely relying upon him. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel was put in the lion's den. Friends, this is a den of hungry lions. You don't need overnight stay. All you need is like three seconds and you'll be eaten. And why will the Lord let him stay overnight? Just to emphasize, my dear friends, that is not the tameness of the lion that had him survive. It is the God who kept, who kept the lion's mouth. Amen? And the Israelites, they have to be in the middle of, in between mountain and the sea and the enemies. The Lord always puts us in a difficult situation to emphasize that it is his power that delivers. It is his power that saves and the disciples, they have to be without a savior before they could perform what God has been asking them to do. And that's a time when they absolutely relied to the Lord for everything. So when you heard the stories that I shared last night, I, some of you might be thinking, oh, that's, uh, that's quite impossible for me. It's not gonna happen. My dear friends, that's what I was telling myself and it's funny because when you, hear, when you hear testimonies, when I heard testimonies before, and I was just saying, oh no, they're just making that up. They're just exaggerating it. And when missionaries share their testimony, I'm thinking at the back of my mind, no, they're just trying to get me on board. They want me to suffer with them. <laughs> the skeptic mind. And then when the Lord called me to be a missionary, I was moving forward and my knees were shaking. Friends, it's not that I have a strong faith. This is the reason why I became a missionary. No, God is somehow enabling us to follow even though we're scared. Amen? And the more, the more we step forward, the more the Lord just shows us again and again that he can and he will. And I remember, friends, when, when I was listening, oh, can I show something? Oh, it's okay, it's not set up, maybe sometimes. Oh, I saw this, so. <laughs> there's, there's a story that I like to share, so maybe I'll share it some other day, maybe tonight. And when the Lord called me to be a missionary, oh, just tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, today, no, no. <laughs> When the Lord called me to be missionary, I was somehow like, I don't know what's gonna happen, Lord. And the Lord is just so amazing that, uh, that he is so patient with us. And this is one thing I, I realized with God, he will not ask us to run with him if we have not walked with him. And he'll not ask us to jump if we have not run with him. And God knows our, our individual strength 
and our weaknesses, and He works with that. Isn't it amazing that we have a God like that who walks at our own pace, who does not push us, who does not shove us? Our God is not a bully. God is amazing. So I remember when the Lord called me to be a missionary, and, and I remember one of my first assignments was to go to India. And when I, when I went uh, to this place, before I went to this place, I was, remember, I, I, I told you I don't receive any salary. And that was my first assignment. I did not even know that I was called to be a missionary during that time. And I decided not to tell people about my need, I'll only tell God. So that particular day, I was thinking, oh Lord, how am I gonna go to India? I only have like $10 in my pocket. And, and friends, uh, I did not know that I'm going to India, not until two days that I was already away from home. So my friend told me, Jem, there's a call for us to go to India. And I said, oh, okay. And that was my first missionary assignment. And, uh, and I have $10 in my pocket. And I said, Lord, if you want me to go, then you have to provide. The Lord provided a ticket, a round trip ticket. So, and then I said, okay, you have a ticket. So how about my pocket money? The Lord used my stingiest relative to give me a call. And that stingy uh, person who, you know, you know stingy? Okay, yeah, a stingy relative. So, and that, that person gave me a call and said, Jem, I heard you're going to India. And I said, yes. So, do you have money? I said, mm-hmm. How much money do you have? $10. I said, how are you gonna survive in India? It's, it's only a week. Uh, and I said, the Lord will provide. And the Lord touched his heart to provide. <laughs> I said, okay, go to the nearest, uh, uh, was this pawn shop, because in the pawn shop, we receive like money transfer there. And I will send you $100. And friends, you know what's amazing? I went to India and back, and the $100 was still intact. And I said, I like this kind of life, Lord. <laughs> so the Lord called me. The next, the next trip was going to Malaysia. Remember that place that I told you? That was, that was the, the next trip. So I went to Malaysia, but this time I came prepared. It's not just 10 bucks, I have like 60 bucks in my pocket. And I'm thinking, Lord, last time I had 10 bucks, so I, I'm relying on my 60 bucks right now. And friends, it's funny because I did not realize that there is a, I forgot that there is a travel tax for us Filipinos when we get out. And the travel tax will cost you like, like 20 to 30 bucks. And then there's a terminal fee, which will cost you another 15 bucks. Friends, my money went down to a little more than like 10 bucks again. Back to square one. <laughs> and it was February. You know why I emphasize this, uh, the, the date? February, because before, when it's cold season, when I say cold back home, that's like 70s, that's cold. <laughs> When it's colder season, I had this, this uh, dandruff situation. Let me, let me share with you this, this dandruff situation. It, it has a point later, I, I promise. And this dandruff, I, I got so irritated with this dandruff, it only comes out when it's cold. And, uh, and there's only one shampoo that, uh, that the dandruff respects, and that's head and shoulders menthol. <laughs> by the way, this testimony is not brought to you by head and shoulders. <laughs> So, so I, you know why I, I share that? Because during this trip, I was so worried because I was flying already to, to Malaysia and I forgot to buy extra shampoo. Because back in the Philippines, we have these sachets. Who among you here is familiar with sachets? It's like small plastic packets, pockets of something. So it's, back in the Philippines, everything, almost everything is in sachet. Shampoo is in sachet, toothpaste are in sachet. Mayonnaise is in sachet. Soy sauce is in sachet. Almost everything, like shoe polish, sachet. Roll on, sachet. Everything is in sachet. Sometimes a spark plug, sachet. There's a, a lot of things in sachet because back home, back in the Philippines, they have to, to resell things in small packets so that people could afford it. And I'm going to, Mal to Malaysia. Remember, my first country that I visited was Malaysia. So I visited that place before, and I know that they don't have sachets. The things that they sell, it's like, it's like big stuff. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, how am I gonna, 
how am I gonna prioritize my shampoo right now because I only have 10 bucks and I have to stay in Malaysia during the time for 10, not 10 days, but one month. Friends, I got so worried. I got so worried and all I could think about while flying midair was my dandruff, was that shampoo. And I forgot that a few months ago, the Lord has taken care of all my needs in that trip. And just the dandruff thing overwhelmed me. And I'm thinking, friends, aren't we sometimes like that? Little things somehow blocks our vision on how powerful our God is. And I'm thinking, God, he's, he's not capable. I'm not saying it, but through my actions, it's as if that God is not capable of taking care of my dandruff. And then the Lord reminded me, have I not been faithful to you? And I said, oh Lord, I'm so sorry. And I said, okay, I'll use whatever shampoo my nephew has because my nephew is a Bible worker in that place. Friends, when my nephew picked me up in the airport, I saw him, he's actually 10 years younger than me. And when I saw him, I was just like this heart and he was bald. <laughs> what did you do? And I said, I shaved off my, my hair. I said, why? And he said, haircut is so expensive here. And I'm thinking, so what shampoo do you use? All I could think about was the shampoo. And I said, I don't use shampoo. I said, what do you use then? I just use soap on my head. I'm thinking, Lord, I could not use soap. And I got so overwhelmed about that thing again. And the Lord just somehow gave me that, that assurance, I will take care. And yet I was not so at peace. And friends, when I arrived in Malaysia, when I arrived in Malaysia, it was Chinese New Year. I love Chinese New Year. <laughs> they don't celebrate New Year in just one day. It's like a week or two weeks. Yeah, and remember, I only have 10 bucks in my pocket. And it's amazing because every night, there's free dinner. <laughs> we go from one house to another. And I'm thinking, Lord, thank you, free food. So God, God supplies my needs. And every house that we went to, they have this, this little ritual in Chinese uh, culture that they give out like this red envelope, huh? that there's money inside, and they call it ang pao and they give it to single people. And I said, thank you, Lord, I'm single. <laughs> Isn't God amazing? <laughs> One of the joys of being single. <laughs> so I had, I had free food and allowance. Friends, isn't God amazing? Amen. God is just so good. And friends, this church is located on the side of a national park. And we have this, this running track, it's like 2.4 kilometers. This, this track is, is big, and, and this track is covered with trees. So even if you go out in midday, if you run, it's, the breeze is just so awesome. And we have to be there every single day, except on Saturdays, to meet a people whom we will bring to the Lord. And that's how we, that, that's how we meet people, and that's how we meet our, our Bible students as well. So we were there, and every single day, friends, we were there, and it's, Malaysia is quite hot. And by the way, three weeks upon that stay, upon that stay in Malaysia, I checked my shampoo. Friends, when I saw my shampoo, by the way, I only have six sachets. When I saw my shampoo, I only consumed two sachets three weeks, the first thing I asked myself, did I take a shower every day? <laughs> yes, I did. And friends, believe this or not, I was taking two showers per day because I had to do like jogging in the morning and we have to visit, to visit houses in the evening. I was taking two showers and I was thinking, this is not possible. How could this be? And the first thing that came to my head was, was the story of that widow in the Zarephath, Zarephath widow with Elijah. And I'm thinking, her oil did not run out until the famine is over. And I'm thinking, this is like the widow in Zarephath, my shampoo head and shoulders is not running out. And friends, isn't God amazing? And I'm thinking, friends, wow, miracles are still happening even now. And I was wondering, why is it happening now and not before because you know what friends because I needed God 
more now than I needed him before. Friends, there's this beautiful quote from Prophets and Kings that says, when the Lord gives a work to be done, let not man stop to inquire into the reasonableness of the command or the probable result of their efforts to obey. The supply in their hands may seem to fall short of the need to be filled, but in the hands of the Lord, it will prove more than sufficient. Can you say amen? Okay, only five of you is convicted to say amen. Can you say amen? amen? My dear friends, we serve a powerful God. We serve a faithful God who supplies what? Every single need, all of our needs. He did not say, I will supply some of your needs. He will say all. So we have no reason. We have no reason to be fearful. And, and while I was there, I'll, I'll just share this stories in Malaysia. While I was there, one of the things that you would love to do in Malaysia is to climb who, who among you here lives, loves to climb mountains, mountain climbing? Friends, I was not like a fan, a fan of mountain climbing before. When friends tell me, hey Jem, let's, let's, let's climb, let's hike, I tell them, no, I'm an Israelite. I said, oh. <laughs> what do you mean you're an Israelite? I murmur along the way. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm a beach person, I'm not, I'm not a mountain person, but my, my, my niece and her friends, they did not want to climb this mountain until I joined, so I was pressured to join them because the, the hike leader said, Jem, you see, if you'll not go, this, these two ladies will not go. I said, okay, I'll go. From then on, I love climbing mountains. Not so high of a climb, but I'm still a little bit of an Israelite. So while I was there in, in Kota Kinabalu, their mountain is so beautiful. There's this mountain, it's called Mount Kinabalu. And it's so majestic, it's just like looking down on you and just like telling you, climb me. And I said, I will. <laughs> and friends, that, that mountain is so expensive to climb, it will cost you like nearly 500 US dollars to climb. And I said, yes, I will climb you because somebody promised to sponsor me. Isn't that amazing? And I'm thinking, I could not afford vacations like that before. While I was still working, now that I'm a missionary, I go to places like that. So before that climb, I spent time. Every morning, I, I had this habit now of starting my day with God, and I could not function well if I have not started my day with God. So, so that particular day, I have to start earlier. We have to leave by five, so I have to wake up by 3 a.m. to do my devotions. And my, my nephew, while he was there in, in uh, Malaysia, he has this uh, double deck, this bunk bed, and I'm on the bunk, top bunk, because I'm smaller, so he's, he's a big guy, he's down there below. And, and before, before being a full-time missionary, I was still a, a photographer, so I, I was transitioning from being a photographer to a missionary. So all my files, all my clients' files are in my laptop. And this is a Philippine-made laptop. So it's not that sturdy. <laughs> so I was doing my devotionals one particular morning, that morning, early morning, and I think every fiber of my being was still asleep. And I opened my laptop, remember I was at the top bunk, bunk. and I put this laptop on, on, uh, on this box, it's like my table, when I opened it, and I was so sleepy that the laptop slipped through my fingers. And I was on the edge of the bed. And all of a sudden, like, bang! It was like horror. And friends, while my laptop was like, it's like slow motion in your head, and you know it's gonna happen. So in between, in between the slip and, and the floor, I was just like, ah! And when it hit the floor, my dear friends, it was like a crazy sound. My nephew was so like startled. He woke up and he told me later on, that was the worst wake up call of his life. <laughs> he thought that it was the second coming of the Lord. <laughs> and with the screaming and the banging, so, so it was crazy. So the moment, the moment he, he finally saw what was happening, he, he could, not, he could not do anything. He was just pacing back and forth and I was shaking, friends, because all my files are there. My clients' files are there and they were not backed up. So I was there on the bed, opening the laptop and switching it on, it's blank. 
and my whole body was shaking. All I could do was pray. So I said, Lord, Lord, I know that with you all things are possible. I, I memorized those verses that I thought I could not memorize before. And I said, Lord, you know, you healed people in your time. I use the word heal rather than fix because it's biblical. So you healed people in your time, so please heal this laptop. You rose people from the dead, so please raise this dead laptop back to life. I was trying to command God and all. And in the middle of my prayer, the Lord somehow reminded me, haven't you surrendered that to me? Haven't you surrendered your life to me? And I was trying to reason out with God, but Lord, half of my life is in. Yes. I said, okay, I'll surrender this back to you again. And I said, now my life is in your hands. And friends, the moment I, the moment I surrendered that to the Lord, there's this peace that came over me. Peace that passes understanding because friends, the Lord reminded me of that commitment that I had with him a month before I attended a, I attended a, a youth conference back in the Philippines and there was a call to surrender. No holding back. Every fiber of our being, give it back to the Lord. And I came forward and I was crying and the Lord remember, let me remember that commitment that I did. And I remember during that time, because remember I was a photographer, I was taking pictures during that time. Remember when, when there is a presentation, we don't, we don't take notes, we just take pictures. <laughs> and while I was taking pictures, my camera died. And thinking, what happened? And I was trying to calibrate it again. It's not functioning. And I'm thinking, full time, huh? <laughs> And that was the indication for me that I have to go full-time ministry. So while I was there, I was trying to, I was trying to, to pray this back, laptop back to life. And the Lord reminded me, remember, you surrendered everything to me. So when I gave it to the Lord, friends, I had peace that passeth understanding. And in the middle of my prayer, I know the Lord changed everything. And, and I was even smiling. I was like a crazy person. Before I was in panic, now I'm smiling. In the middle of my prayer, before I even said a word, amen, there was this sound. It's a PC. So when I open up, it's back to life. My prayer was, Lord, if you heal this laptop, I will tell about your goodness everywhere I go. But if you choose not to heal this laptop, I'll still praise your name. And friends, you know what? God is so awesome. He wanted me to share about this goodness. So everywhere I go, friends, I share about this laptop. And there was one time the Lord brought me back to Malaysia and there was like 800 people, 800, 900 people who were there and I was sharing this laptop and they were so blessed. And then when I went back to my room, I switched this laptop and I was thinking, Lord, until when this laptop will be functional? And then it's all black again. The Lord convicted me, unbelief. So I knelt beside my laptop and I prayed, Lord, please forgive me, forgive my unbelief. I confess my sins. And then before I said amen, <laughs> it's back again. Friends, it is us who's limiting the power of God in our lives. It is our unbelief. It is the knowledge that we do not have of the power of the God that we serve of the power of the God that loves us so much that somehow limits us from seeing the goodness of our God. So there was, there's this beautiful quote here from Help in Daily Living that says, many who profess to be Christ's followers have an anxious, troubled heart because they are afraid to trust themselves with God. They do not make a complete surrender to Him for they shrink from the consequence that such a surrender May, may involve, unless they do make the surrender, they cannot find peace. Amen? And friends, look at this. Who are we surrendering to? The God of the universe. The God who just spoke and all this world came into existence. If we're surrendering to a lower power being, then we have, we have to be very, very anxious. But if you are surrendering to a God, who is all powerful, who is almighty, and who is all faithful. Friends, you do not have anything to be worried about. Amen? Amen? 
So, um, by the way, the moment, <laughs> the moment my laptop came back to life, I was thinking, I have to back this up. This is just the responsible, responsible thing to do. I have to back this up. And I'm thinking, but how can I back this up? I don't have a hard drive and I don't have the money for the hard drive. And I remembered, I still have this, this ATM account, but in that ATM account was not my money, it's the money of my client. So I'm thinking, I just have to withdraw that because I need to buy this, this is emergency. So I bought that, not knowing where will I get the money to pay that back. So one particular time, when we were having this, this Bible study, there was this Hindu lady, she's a doctor, and uh, she is so in love with the Lord. And uh, one, of, one of those evenings when we were having Bible study at her apartment, she said, Jan, can I talk to you later at the end of our study? I said, okay, yeah, I just, I just want to, to tell you something very important. So after the study, I sat down with her and she said, Jan, I just want to ask you, what do you need? The Holy Spirit somehow convicted me to tell you, to ask you, what do you need? Remember friends, my deal with God is not to ask, not to borrow, not to tell people about my need. And then there was this lady who asked me, what's my need? Friends, for the life of me, I could not remember what my need was. Remember, what do I need? I need the money to pay for that, for that hard drive. And the Lord just took that out away from my memory and I'm thinking, I'm sorry, but I don't seem to have a need right now. And the lady said, no, 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 Jem. The Lord did not tell me for no reason to ask you if you do not need anything. And then he said, but I could not remember. I don't need, the Lord has been supplying all my needs. I said, Jem, I know you Filipinos are quite shy. <laughs> it, she doesn't know about this Filipino. <laughs> and, and she told me, because last week I have I have, the, I have met this lady, she's a new secretary in our, in our hospital, and she just came from the Philippines, and the Lord convicted me, the Holy Spirit convicted me to ask her about her need, because she seems, she seems to be needing something, and the lady was not somehow willing to tell me about her need, so I have to press it out of her. So this is the conversation. So the doctor asked her what, what does she need, and she said, uh, I'm okay, he said, no, 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 tell me what do you need because the Holy Spirit is asking me, what do you need? And the lady said, I need a mattress. I just moved into this house and I don't have a mattress. I said, okay, I have a ma an extra mattress back home, but that is not the need that the Holy Spirit wants me to fill. What do you need? And the le lady was quite teary-eyed. She said, I need a fridge. And the doctor said, okay, I'll get you a fridge, but still, that is not the need that the Lord wants me to fill. And this lady was breaking down, said, I need a car. <laughs> and a doctor said, that's the need that the Lord wants me to fill. And now she turns to me and she said, now tell me, what do you need? <laughs> and I was tempted to say, I need a car too. <laughs> but I don't know how to drive. <laughs> Friends, for the life of me, I could not remember still what do I need. And she said, Jem, you're so stubborn. And I said, but I don't know what I need. And the Lord is telling me to ask you, what do you need? And I could not remember. So our conversation ended without me telling her about my need. And then she said to me, since you're so stubborn, what I should do is, I'll just give you this ang pao and Every month, as the Lord convicts me to send you some, something, let me know where you're at. And for this whole year, I will send you money. Friends, when I opened the Ang Pao, it was $100 inside. And then I said, oh, I need this. <laughs> I forgot that I have that need. And then I begin to realize, God is the one who stopped me from remembering what I needed. So that my deal with him, not to tell people about my need, not to even give a clue to people about my need. God wants to prove to me, even though you'll not say it, I know it. Isn't our God an amazing God? Isn't our God an awesome God? This is the God who's asking us to not trust what you can do. Trust what I can do. God is telling us right now, friends, 
lean on him. Not just lean on him 90%. Absolutely rely upon the God who's asking you to trust him with all of your heart. Because you know what, friends? You'll miss out if you don't. You'll miss out if you don't. Again, I'd like, I'd like to share this, this beautiful quote once again. The tenor of the Bible is to inculcate this trust in human power, of human power, and to encourage trust in a divine power. This morning while I was reading my devotions, I, I came across this beautiful thought from, from Review and Herald, and it's also found in the book Prayer. It says here, God's goodness in hearing and answering prayer places us under heavy obligation to express our thanksgiving for the favors bestowed upon us. Did you get this? Places us on what? Heavy obligation to express our thanksgiving for the favors bestowed upon us. Friends, we have a lot of things to praise God and to thank God for. And it is our heavy obligation to express that. The reason why we're not really Adventists but Sadventists is because we don't express it more. Friends, just sit down for a moment and think about what God has done in your life. There are so many reasons to praise Him and thank Him for. And the more you praise Him and thank Him, the more you'll be encouraged to absolutely rely upon Him for everything. Can you say amen? So, at this hour of, of the day, I'd like for us to group ourselves into groups of three. And let us gather together. And let's just thank God and praise God. And somehow ask God to give us the courage, to give us the strength, and to remind us of His invitation to lean on Him absolutely rely upon him for everything can we do that let's let's take three minutes so even just short prayers as you go around and at the end of this three minutes if you're still if you're done if the three minutes is not over just be in in a reverent mode and at the end of this i'll lead a song and then i'll close before before we do that let's let's sing one song When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey.